Hi, my name is Rolf and I'm working for Aerodisc. I've been sourcing telescopes and optical components um, for the last five years. I do testing, interferometry, uh, metrology, and um, yeah, now I'm getting into the astronomy field. Well, I came to astronomy the other way around. So I started with the optics and testing optics. And in Germany, you know, the seeing isn't great, the weather is cloudy, and then when I had my first event in the US at the eclipse this year, and I finally got to know the you know, awesome American skies, um, you know, it just caught me. And now I'm, I'm glad that I can tour the US, you know, introduce our products and um, get deeper into the astronomy and astrophotography. I know a guy in Germany that builds those interferometers, Wolfgang Klebowski, and um, we became friends and so, um, I just brought that technology and that testing methodology to Aerodisc. I mean, we have a Zygo, we have a other Fizo, but we needed to test in green. And um, so this whole design philosophy, you know, what an Apo should be, around what color it should be designed, how it should be tested, this sort of all came together because like, we in Germany, we have a certain understanding, this is what an APO has to be. And if an APO is not this, then you know, it's, it, it's, you could still call it a triplet, but it's probably not a proper APO. So what makes an APO an APO? I think an APO is um, when all colors are corrected as well as they are. And um, if you choose lesser, cheaper glass, you don't have all the tools to correct all colors equally well. And then you have to decide, what do you want to do? I mean, if you have a narrowband filter, H-alpha is in red. So, you know, if you only shoot H-alpha heavy stuff, like you could care less about the green and the blue spectrum, but um, the other band is between green and blue. So. If you only design in red, then the green won't be as good and the blue will probably be quite bad. And then you just don't have um, color correction over the whole field. We are favoring green because, well, humans mostly have um, green in their eye, but we also focus on green because it's in the middle. So when green is good, then red and blue will be decent. And for visual, of course, we don't need the reducers, right? And so they're designed specifically without the reducers to be well used visually with correction in green. And then once you go to photography, of course, we have the two lens and we have three lens um, correctors that do their thing. Um, so our scopes are probably good visually and good for photography. Whereas some scopes, they're probably mainly made to take good pictures. Normally you hire an optics designer and he designs a lens and you basically hire him as you would hire a composer to make you a symphony, right? So you give him certain things, um, but he also has to know what he wants to do. And so if we would say, hey, it needs to be sheep and it needs to be for photography, then he would design it completely different than when we say, hey, you know, we have Hoya glass and we want to have the best experience visually, but it also has to be great with a corrector so that people can take great pictures. And then it sort of happens automatically. I mean, he takes all those inputs and he takes the glass and he puts certain constraints in ZMAX and then he goes from this. And so when we added different scopes, then he also had to decide that this corrector had to work well with uh, the 140, the 106, the 96, all the way down to the 85. And then for some scopes, like the 106, we say, okay, the double lens corrector isn't good enough. We need a triplet corrector for the maximum back focus and for just perfect color correction. We used FCT1 because it works really well in doublets because you just have one less lens element to correct your colors. And so for triplet, but this is something that you notice in ZMAX, 
like you also have to look at the other classes that you uh, at the other class that is used and uh, you know you can compare the FPL 53 with the FCD 100 because of the Abbey numbers and of course there are a few different things uh, other things are happening and then people have different coatings and so it all depends on the whole the coatings you have the raw materials you have how well can you process it um, like every class uh, used has its um, reason to be of being at the last star party someone told me that um, some people on cloudy nights call it nulled in green because i'm still trying to find the the, the perfect word right um, to describe what an apo um, should be designed like well a visual apo um, some people call this null and green also polystrel and um, you know it, this basically would mean that you need to reach a high strel in green and in red your design already has to uh, enable the red and green and blue to reach those high strel numbers so if i were designed only in red then no matter how good the optics are made they won't be diffraction limited in blue so this has to be part of the design and then the final testing with the Zygo and with the Twyman Green that just makes sure that the glass has been worked correctly and really hit the mark set by the initial design. Well in photography a uh, high strel isn't really necessary because of the exposure time. Um, I think you would want to be 0.85 strel. It doesn't have to be a high strel. I mean, the light should go where it should go and should, you know, 0.85 means 85% of the light hits the airy disc and the rest gets scattered. If too much scattering happens, then maybe even with long exposures, you might not be able to fix it. Um, but the reason you have a high strel in red is only if you have a high strel in red, because it's different wavelengths, once you do the division and you multiply it with the green wavelength, the strel is going to drop. So there's no way that you're going to have a 099 strel in red and a 099 strel in green. It's just not going to happen. So when you do the lens grinding, um, you have masters that you use during production. And you can see the Newton rings. That's just glass on glass and if they deviate too much you can see it. So we don't actually measure the real strel as a number. You can make te terribly good telescopes without doing this. I mean all the scopes from 100 years ago, some of them are really really good and all they did they had the knife edge and they were looking at the stars and they were polishing. You know they didn't need, you know, if their eyes are really good and they know what they're looking at. What the interferometry and metrology brings to the table is that you get an exact number that it can be quantified. And before, you know, somebody was looking at us like, ah, oh, that's good enough. But that was this guy, right? And um, sometimes people fudge. So, you know, the, the metrology and the, the actual testing, that's in the end just to make sure that it's not someone's opinion, but that it's, um, you know, based in uh, optical science. Yeah. Any refractor that we make has um, three screws um, where the lens attaches to the body, where you can um, collimate it a little bit. So uh, collimating an art pose isn't too difficult. You probably would do it as you would with any other uh, telescope. You put a collimator inside uh, with some LEDs and you already n know where it's at and then you have three screws that you can adjust with your Allen wrench and uh, to achieve collimation. All our triplets have um, the lens attached to the tube via this flange. So you can remove the lens quite easily by removing the screw with the Allen wrench. The second screw just pushes on a plate. So for collimation you would um, open these a little bit and then use the, the, the other screw to collimate your scope and then tighten them again with the screw that holds it to the flange. Earlier we talked about um, what we do on the inside of the scope. So um, all our shrouds are lined with felt um, to reduce um, reflections. The inside, of course, is black uh, with baffles. 
The rear of the 140 and the 204 is removable. Um, when this section comes out, you can um, reduce the travel and incorporate optical elements like a bino viewer. So whatever your needs are, um, if you're visual and you want a bino viewer, then this would accommodate you. If you want to put more filters or other optical things for photography, you know, maybe you want to move this or whatever you want to do. Um, all our scopes have an M63 thread where the two inch um, eyepiece adapter threads into. This is our small 092 two element um, flat field reducer. This works with all our scopes from the 85 all the way up to the 140. One of the interesting things is that the back focus is adjustable. So if you add a filter or maybe even a filter wheel, you can just dial it in and it moves the whole lens pack inside. So first you would try to find a focus with your telescope, then find focus with the reducer, but because it moves the element a little bit and then you have to fine tune again with the focuser. Uh, for support purposes, we're based in the US, so you feel free to contact me or your favorite retailer.